Well, we are in a, a series uh, working our way through uh, parts of the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms is, uh, in many ways, what we're wanting to do, our aim is to share all of our life with God. Uh, we want God to be uh, engaged in all of our areas. And, uh, and even as I say that, I realize there is probably some hesitancy uh, to that if we're, if we're honest. Uh, it's like, I like God here in this area, but not sure I really want them over here. Um, well, we want to learn. Uh, we want to grow. One of the things we want to grow in, uh, if we're going to be a follower of Christ and grow in our love for Christ, one of the things that we want to do is we want to grow in prayer. Uh, prayer. What is prayer? Uh, prayer, in many ways, uh, we want to talk about what it is, uh, how does it work, uh, does it even work? Uh, there are probably some of you here who are wondering, does prayer have any effect at all? Does it matter whether I pray or not? That is a totally fair question. It's a great question. Uh, we want to be able to uh, answer those questions throughout our series. And, and, and prayer in many ways, let me try to simplify prayer. We, we hear the word pray and it's like, oh, I don't know, do I have to have a special hat for that or a special bracelet or do I have to do something, you know? Um, here, here, what prayer is. In many ways, it's moving from a, a inner dialogue, a monologue, that, that, that inner conversation uh, that you have with yourself, uh, and it's moving to a dialogue, from a monologue to a dialogue in simply just talking to God. Uh, it's a conversation with the Lord. And we want to learn of what does it look like to have a conversation with God in all of our areas of life. It doesn't even matter. Does he even care? Uh, and so the book of Psalms is, is, a, is a gift for us to, to help us in, in learning and growing in this area of prayer and conversation with God and, and what does it matter and, and how does it work and how do I do that and, and answering all kinds of questions like that. But what we learn out of the book of Psalms is we learn who God is. We do that in, in all of the books of the Bible. We learn more about who God is, how he reveals himself through his word. That's why uh, we always open up God's word and, and look to what God has to say uh, every Sunday morning. Uh, we do this in our small groups. We do this in, in our ministries. We want to know what God has to say for our lives. We believe that God created us and that his way is always right and always best. And so if we don't know what God has to say, how are we going to be able to follow him? And so that's why we always turn to God's word. And so we learn about who God is and we get a picture of him in the book of Psalms. You see, God is a God who speaks and a God who acts. He is a God who speaks and a God who acts. Uh, and so we want to know this God. We want to know who he is. It, it matters what you think about God. I truly believe the most important thing that you think about uh, is what you think about God. What you think about God is the most important thing that you think about. It will affect what you do. It will affect how you respond to life. Uh, it, will resp it will affect all of those things, what you think about God. So it matters. Let me give you an example uh, of, of showing here why it matters what you think about God. If you think that God is, is relatively small, um, we would never say that, well, uh, we would all probably say, oh, God's big. No, I get God's big. But when we, when we act as though, uh, we, can, we can function as atheists. <laughs> uh, I'm not an atheist, but we will sometimes function that way where we don't think much of God at all in our, in our life. Oh yeah, I know God is there for like Sunday mornings, uh, or when there's chaos in the world and chaos in my life, I'll really call on God. But otherwise, we, we just don't interact much with God. You see, God is sometimes considered small. Uh, and if God is small, or uh, if God is, um, when, when you think, what does God think about you? And if you think, if what comes to mind, uh, what does God think about you? And you what comes to your mind is he is disappointed. 
He is disgusted. Uh, he is irritated. If, if those are, are words that come to your mind of what you think God thinks about when he thinks of you, or if you think that he is, uh, we, we've seen in, in stores, perhaps you've even responded this way, uh, as, as a father, but you get irritated at, uh, at you see a father get irritated at a child uh, in the store maybe, and he's told him for the umpteen time of not doing something, he does it, and so that father just goes, thump, and he thumps him, right, and says, come on, get with it, right, and if you picture God like that, I don't believe you will ever turn to God. If if your picture of God is just a thumping God waiting for you to get it right, you probably won't ever really turn to him much. You're not going to go to him because you're just going to get thumped again. You're going to get scolded. You're going to get uh, corrected constantly. And if you picture God as just irritable, um, if you're a parent, uh, all of us experience irritability, but sometimes it seems as though uh, we have a special way as a parent to be especially irritated at a child who continues to keep interrupting. And eventually you just go, ah, what? And uh, uh, I've seen it happen before. Uh, and um, if that's your picture of God, uh, you probably aren't going to go to him much because you don't want to irritate him. Uh, if, if that's your picture of him, or if you just feel like you need to get it all together. Uh, once I get it together, then I'll go to him. Or here, I hear this regularly among Christians. When you put yourself into the terrible situation, uh, you place yourself in, uh, in that hole that you are in. You dug the hole, you placed yourself in it through a stupid decision that you made, through sin, through uh, just foolishness. You place yourself there. It's like, well, I got what's coming to me, so um, why would you turn to the Lord then? Uh, can you really turn to God then? So what keeps us from turning to God many times is shame. And, and shame uh, will say, well, I place myself here, I get what I deserve. When, when this gets better, when I, when I figure this out, when I get out of this hole, then, then God can obviously work. But until then, I'm, I'm stuck. <laughs> you see, th these are the very real things that, that most of us, if not all of us, uh, have, have crosses our minds and, 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 and goes on in our lives at various points. And so, so what you think about God matters. Does he care about your particular world, the things that are going on in, in your life? Does he care that, uh, that you just started class uh, that you just started school. Th th does he care? Uh, for, for those of you mothers that are changing diapers, does he care that you're changing yet another, another diaper? Uh, for those of you who are, have toddlers, does he care? Does God care about the fact that you have to read this story again, <laughs> again, and again? Uh, does he care? Um, does, does God care about whether uh, you have a, a meeting with your boss this week that may be a difficult one? Does he, does he care whether you're eating well? Does he care whether you sleep well? Is, is God engaged and does he care about uh, whether you buy an RV? <laughs> uh, that you go to a small group? Or that you stop going to a small group? Does, does he care whether you're uh, engaged in church uh, in person or online? Does God care about those things? Seemingly insignificant in the busyness of all the things that God must certainly have to juggle, does God care about those things? Um, you're late for an appointment, you have a meeting. It's your own fault. Does God care? <laughs> Is it okay to ask God then for help? 
uh, even though you placed yourself there. Um, what you think about God matters. And, and it affects how you respond to the world around you. And so it, 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 this, has, this has its ramifications into all the, the things that you are facing uh, today and this mar- to tomorrow and into this, this week. It matters what you think about God. And so the, the Psalms is a gift for us to, to help us. We, we learn through the Psalms, uh, we, we discover or rediscover who God is. And we learn how to talk to God. How, how do we share all of our life with Him? What does that look like? Um, is, is, that, is it safe to do that? <laughs> um, with, with that in mind, we're approaching our study through Psalms in a couple of different ways, uh, two primary ways. One, when we go to uh, a, a psalm or a couple of psalms, uh, chapters, they, um, there's times when we will look at them verse by verse. So, uh, for instance, uh, chapter 1 and chapter 15, we've done that so far, more verse by verse. We've looked at each, each part. Uh, we looked at Psalm 119 two weeks ago. We did that topically. We looked over the, the themes of Psalm 119 and looked at that more topically. So there's times when we'll look more verse by verse. For instance, next week, uh, we look at a, a favorite, Psalm 23. Uh, we'll go verse by verse through that. Uh, other times, like this morning, we're going to look at more uh, topically. I want to see the themes throughout. Uh, we're going to look at, at chapters 3, 4, and 5. So three chapters this morning, they're small. Uh, and so if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm chapter Three. And uh, if you don't have your Bibles and uh, you're here uh, in the seat, there's uh, about every other chair, there's a Bible there. Uh, and I think it's page 472, 473 uh, for, Psalm, uh, Psalm, for Psalm 3. And so find your way there. We want to look at this and I want us to get a brush stroke of these three chapters uh, because we're going to see what is the what was the experience of the psalmist? Now, the psalmist for these three chapters happens to be King David, David, the same David, David and Goliath, uh, King David. Uh, he is the author of each of these. But the psalmist here, we want to know uh, what he prays, how he prays, uh, how he invites the Lord into all of his life. We learn about who God is out of these three chapters. And uh, so I, I want us to, to, to get that. How do we move from the inner monologue to the dialogue, right? And these three chapters are certainly going to be tools for that. So three things that we'll see. One, I want us to get a picture of what is he experiencing? What are those emotions that are going on in his, uh, in, in his world? Because they incredibly relate to you and to me. So what's going on in his, in his world? And then secondly, how does he respond to that? And then thirdly, uh, why does he respond that way? We're going to learn a whole lot about who God is based off of uh, his response and, and what's going on in his world. So that's what I want us to see this morning. And so we'll jump in here uh, in the first part that I want us to look at is uh, the, the emotions, the, the, what, what's going on in his world, what's happening in his life. Uh, all these different things. One of those, something that you may relate to is uh, overwhelmed. Uh, does that preach? <laughs> uh, feeling of overwhelmed. You just are at your end. You're tired, exhausted. You feel overwhelmed. The psalmist is here. He, he understands this. Uh, Psalm 3, verses 1 and 2. Lord, how my foes increase. There are many who attack me. Many say about me, there is no help for him in God. In other words, there's those around him who are saying, uh, God is never going to rescue you. He's, he just 
he, he keeps getting pushed back. He keeps just getting beat down and keeps getting hit and just keeps coming. And it's tiresome. It's, it's overwhelming. By the way, uh, in your psalm, uh, right after verse 2, and you'll see it there after verse 4, after verse 8, there's this little word called salah. Uh, you'll see this in a number of psalms. When the psalmist writes that, uh, it is this, this word that has the idea of an interlude, a, a pause. Uh, when you see this in a psalm, the idea is stop for a minute, pause, hold on, think on this. I want you to, to think about what is going on here. Very countercultural. Uh, we would rather just ignore those little salahs because uh, we just don't have time uh, for slowing down. Let me read the psalm. Okay, check. I got it. Wow. Woo. Wow. Hard things going on. Bummer. Next, ver- next, you know, and we move on. The idea of psalms and really all of God's word is that you slow down and consider what God's word says. You, you think on it. How does it, what is he saying? What's, what's happening here? And, and then we begin to think on it in our, and we apply that into our own lives. Uh, so, Lord, how my foes increase. There are many who attack me. Many say about me, there is no hope for him in God. You, do you feel, you, he wants us to feel the weight of life that is that's coming down on him. Um, even chapter 4, verse 1, uh, answer me when I call, God who vindicates me. You freed me from affliction. Uh, be gracious to me and hear my prayer. In the sense of, uh, so you freed me from affliction, but, but now, God, be gracious to me and hear my prayer. Um, Be gracious, please hear me. I, I need you to speak. I, I'm feeling the weight. Sometimes in the Psalms, they give us clues to specifics of things that are happening. Uh, a lot of them don't. They're, they're uh, in a sense, they're generic, which I appreciate, so they're easier to apply into our own lives, and we don't get lost in a, in a specificity of something. Uh, But this one's important. In in chapter 3, right before verse 1, it says chapter 3, and then it says, A psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. This gives you a specific clue into what's happening here when he writes. When David fled from his son Absalom. Uh, Quick little snapshot uh, vignette story here. Absalom is his son, and he uh, is wicked. He rises up, and he has every intent to dethrone King David, his father. He wants to dethrone him, and in fact, his aim is to kill him, to, to destroy him and his kingdom, and to become the king over the kingdom, which in fact, he does dethrone him for a period of time while he goes out and hunts to try to kill his own father. Picture the scene. Talk about heaviness. David's son, this isn't just some, even even old friend, this is his own flesh and blood. His own son has risen up and is doing everything in his power to destroy his own father. It's about hurt, pain, the, the, the overwhelming pain. Why is this important? See, when we slow down and you think of your own life, for, for those of you that are parents that have maybe some older kids, um, this begins to, to resonate with you. When, you're, when your child says something to you that just cuts to the core, it, it burns. They, maybe you have a, a child that has sought to, to ruin your reputation, to destroy you. They say things that just hurts. 
how overwhelming. If you have a wandering child, you, you, you get this. It hurts. Uh, uh, we, we can relate to the psalmist, maybe not in the specifics, but I certainly can understand the pain and the hurt. Overwhelm. Maybe one, uh, just one or two others, emotions that come out here, similar to overwhelm, but uh, the feeling of, of being weary, frustrated, weariness. Uh, chapter 4, verse 2. How long, exalted ones, will my honor be insulted? How long will you love what is worthless and pursue a lie? Um, verse 6. Many are asking, who can show us anything good? Let the light of your face shine on us, Lord. Um, who, who can show us anything good? Those around him, I have... Um, they are rebellious against God. They, um, they are not seeking after the Lord. In fact, you can, you can, uh, who can show us anything good of, we want more, more, more. We're hungry, we're hungry for more. God isn't enough. God isn't enough for, for my needs. Show us more, I want more. We get that. Um, it's exhausting. Those around you in your, in your world uh, just, just constantly beating you down day after day. You, you desire to walk after God and you're a believer in a non-believing world. How exhausting. Maybe a believer in a family, in a non-believing family. Uh, a... You have to go to work, and you're in that environment, and it's just an ungodly environment. Just constantly beat down. Weary. It makes you weary. How do you keep going? How do you live for him in the midst of all of that? And it's hard. I, I, I can appreciate chapter 5, verse 1. Listen to my words, Lord. Consider my sighing. Uh, or uh, my groaning would be another word for that, sighing. Uh, sighing is something that, uh, it's this, uh, uh, there's not really words. Uh, Angela uh, has, has helped me, uh, my wife has helped me to become uh, aware of times that I sigh. Um, I may be in the kitchen and I'm doing something and I just, and I don't even necessarily always recognize it, but it, it's what it's done and we've become attuned to is it's pointing to something going on in me that I feel weary about. Almost always. I just feel weary. I'm tired. I, something is going on in my, in my heart that is, is hard. And so we've come to recognize those sighs and say, well, what's, what's going on? You decide what's going on. Sometimes it's, uh, I'm just tired. <laughs> um, or sometimes, uh, yeah, I, I don't really have the words to express. <sighs> this helps me give me words in that. One, one, more, uh, one more emotion here. Uh, look at chapter 4, verse 4. Be angry and do not sin. On your bed, reflect in your heart and be still. Uh, be angry and do not sin. The, the emotion of anger. <laughs> uh, anger. We all, uh, every one of us, uh, is fair to say, every one of us has an anger issue. <laughs> we have an anger problem. Uh, we, we, we struggle with what to do with that emotion of anger. Now, some of you aren't struggling at all. Uh, you just, woo. Um, but um, uh, we have an anger problem. Um, we deal with anger, that emotion of anger, multiple different ways. For some of you, you stuff. You feel anger, and good Christians aren't angry, so you, and you stuff it all. Uh, and you've been told, good, anger, good Christians don't get angry. 
Uh, but anger is an emotion that God gives. It's the question of what you do with it. Um, for some of you, uh, you, you explode. Uh, we would say you go nuclear. Uh, your anger comes out in, in rage. You, uh, you, you yell and scream. You, you curse. Uh, it, it ramps up. If it's never dealt with, it will continue to increase. And you will uh, potentially throw things. Uh, you will hit things. Uh, you will uh, hit others. Uh, you, it just it continues to grow and build. You go, you go nuclear. Uh, anger. For others, uh, you will turn to ranting. Uh, uh, ranting, grumbling, complaining, uh, and uh, you go to social media or you'll go to others. And for some reason, this phrase uh, is gets spun around a lot in our culture today. I'm just being honest. Uh, to be honest with you, like this is the, uh, you get to say that. If you say that, it allows you to be completely rude, unkind, and unloving. If I get to say, I'm just going to be honest with you, and you go, and it all comes out. Um, uh, Anger, ranting, uh, grumbling, complaining, um, lots of different ways. We see it everywhere. We just live in an angry culture today. Our society is just angry. Uh, You you just drive down the road, uh, cut somebody off, and see how they gesture uh, for you. Um... You uh, go to the store and you see people get angry. Just little things that, that shouldn't set people off and they, they seem to set us off. Um, uh, things that we read, it's just an angry, it's an angry culture. Anger is something that all of us deal with. Uh, we all have a problem with anger. The question is, what do we do with it? And so here's three different Emotions, if you read through these three chapters and, and beyond, you'll find lots more emotions going on, but, but here's three for us. Here he says, be angry and do not sin. How does he respond? How does he respond to these different emotions? We get that now. We, we can understand. I can relate. Here's things that I, that I feel. Various times in my life, in my week, I feel these things. How does he respond? I'll keep this short because... Uh, because it's the why he responds the way he does that really begins to pop for this. But, but he responds. Here's the key thing that we see. How does he respond to the things that are happening in his world? How does he respond to the things that are going on in his world? Well, chapter 3, verses, verse 1. Lord, how my foes increase. There are many who attack me. Um, Verse 7, rise up, Lord, save me. Um, Verse uh, verse 4, I cry aloud to the Lord. Um, Chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, listen to this. Listen to my words, Lord. Consider my sighing. Pay attention to the sound of my cry. My King and my God, for I pray to you. In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I plead my case to you and watch expectantly. Uh, Side note, I love this pray and watch idea, pray and watch, but anyway, that's a freebie. Um, What do we see that the psalmist is doing? How does he respond to the life that is going on? There is heat that comes in on his world, and how does he respond? What is he doing? I think I just heard somebody say, uh, what? He prays, yes, God bless you, yes. He prays, right? Uh, He's praying. He's turning from a monologue to a dialogue. He's talking to God. He turns to the Lord. So it's it's everywhere throughout here. He's turning to God, and he's he's, he's honest with God. I mean, just look at chapter 3, verse 7. Rise up, Lord, save me, my God. You strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Wow. Dave, you have an anger problem, buddy. Uh, Like, (laughs) what is the deal? Um, You need to get some help here. 
Um, now, we're going to see a number of psalms uh, as we work through the series of these kinds of prayers. So I won't spend much time here, but, but just know, here's what I love about this. It's raw. He's turning to the Lord, and he doesn't have it all together. He doesn't have to have all the answers. He doesn't have to have it fixed. He's, it's just raw, turning to the Lord, and he's asking for God to be just. God, would you be just? Bring justice to this injustice going on. It's, it's raw. I, I love that. He, so he's turning to the Lord in his, in his, in his just openness. It's, it's raw. He... He trusts in the Lord. Uh, Chapter 4, verse 5. Offer sacrifices in righteousness and trust in the Lord. He he trusts in the Lord. Um, Just a few verses down, verse 8. I will lie down, I will both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, Lord, make me live in safety. So he's going to lie down and sleep. You know, that's one of the best things that some of us can do. Uh, is go, take a nap. Go, go to sleep. Um, you, we need sleep. So we think that we can live in such a way, in such a busy world, and just keep adding and adding and adding and adding to our lives without taking anything out. And we are finite. We are created so that we cannot do that. We need the Lord. And so there's times we just need to go to sleep. And we need rest. How does he respond? He goes to sleep. He trusts in the Lord. And he sleeps. I love it. Uh, Ever fall asleep praying? (laughs) Um, That is beautiful. That is great. Uh, How rude. God's like, what is up with that? No. Don't you think that God just loves it? We just talk into him and you you fall asleep. It's beautiful. Um, In chapter 5, verse 7, I enter your house. By the abundance of your faithful love, I bow down toward your holy temple and reverential all of you. You know what he does? He worships. He, 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 he goes and he worships. So he trusts in the Lord, he sleeps, and he worships. He responses. Responses to God. He, he recognizes what is true versus what is untrue. If you read through chapter 5, uh, verses 9 and 10, you'll see that. Uh, he, he recognizes what's true versus what isn't true. We see what he's experiencing. We see how he responds, but why? The reason why he responds the way he does is because of who God is. And this is what you want to get. This is what we want to get. If we know who God is, it will help us in our response. Look at how he responds because of who God is. Um, He doesn't have to get it all right before he goes to God. He, he simply is going to turn to the Lord because, uh, chapter 3, verse 3, you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. Um, chapter 5, verse 12, you, Lord, bless the righteous one. You surround him with favor like a shield. So chapter 5, verse 12, and chapter 3, verses, verse 3, very similar. God is a shield. He is a shield about me, around me. He, he surrounds me. He, he protects me. He, God, you are my protector. You, you protect me. The battle rages around me, but my hope is in you. Chaos surrounds, but I put my hope in you because you are a shield. Nothing will take place that hasn't already passed through your hands. I can trust you. I am in your hands. You see who God is? He's a shield. God is a shield. He, he is always near. Uh, he engages. Uh, chapter 3, verse 4. I cry aloud to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. The Lord answers me. Chapter 4, verse 3. Similarly, Know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. The Lord will hear me when I call to him. He hears you. Uh, um, 
Know the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. If you have trusted in Christ, you're a believer in Jesus, you're a Christian, it means he has chosen you and he has set you apart for him. You are a child of God. You are set apart for him. You're chosen. And he hears your cry. He knows what is going on and he wants you to cry out to him. He hears you. It tells me that, that he is engaged. He hears you. He doesn't ignore you. God doesn't ignore you. He knows what's going on in you. And he doesn't ignore. He, he sustains. Chapter 3, verse 5, I lie down and sleep because, and I double, I under, uh, double underline, because the Lord sustains me. He upholds me. He sustains me. I'm in his hands. He, he holds on to me. He gives me safety. We, we saw that in chapter 4, verse 8. I lie down and sleep in peace. I can sleep in peace? Why? For you alone, Lord, make me live in safety. You alone. I, I work hard. Uh, so this is something that I do. Uh, I think we all do. But I work hard and I try to figure things out. I try to figure out solutions. I get into a, a, a pickle and uh, there's, there's stressors going on. I feel the heat of life and sometimes thorns come out or I, I try to figure it out. And so I, it, it, I, I turn it over. It's that inner monologue that I was talking about earlier. And I try to figure this out. <sighs> Get out of the situation. Make things better. And, and so, for you alone, Lord, make me live in safety. It's not, gonna be, it's, it's not on me. It's on him. You see, so the, the psalmist can turn to the Lord because it's, it's not on him. It's, it is on the Lord. I turn to you because you are my safety. You are my shield. You're the one who... Who, who holds me, who lifts me up. You're my safety. You, you give me joy. You, you sustain me. Maybe it's worth saying that God is holy. One of the things that we learn out of this is that God is holy. He's pure. Uh, look at chapter 5, uh, verse, verse 4 through 6 here. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness, Evil cannot dwell with you. The boastful cannot stand in your sight. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who tell lies. The Lord abhors the violent and treacherous people. Um, God is holy. This is his very character. He is holy. Um, I, I love this verse 4. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil cannot dwell with you. He is holy. He's pure. He's set, us, set apart from all others. He is holy. He doesn't delight in wickedness. Now, so let think on this for a sec. Um, when we slow down and think on this. He doesn't delight in wickedness. He doesn't laugh. He, he doesn't chuckle. He doesn't get a kick out of Harm that is done to you. He doesn't delight in wickedness. When, when evil comes upon you, when others hurt you and harm you, God is not in heaven just going, that, that's pretty funny. That never crosses his mind. He is holy. He is pure. He doesn't, he doesn't delight in wickedness. This is, this is good. This is a relief. This is telling us that God is just, that, that God hates evil, that he will accomplish his purposes. This tells me that, that God is engaged, that he, he cares about these very things that are done against me. The, the slander, the hurt, the words, the, the things that are done, God cares about those things in your world cares about that. 
he doesn't take it lightly. This is good. I'm grateful. I'm grateful of all the harm that is going on in the world, the abuse that goes on, the things that we see around the world, the things that happen in your world. God cares about those things. They don't go beyond his notice. He will accomplish his purposes. He will bring justice. He is fair. He is right. He is good. He cares. He will make your paths straight before you. He, he makes your path straight. It's chapter 5, verse 8. Uh, let me give you one more. One more thing about God that is important here. Verse 7, chapter 5, verse 7. But I enter your house by, I circled that, by the abundance of your faithful love. The abundance of your faithful love. Um, the abundance. Maybe your, uh, your translation says steadfast love. Uh, or uh, maybe your translation says unfailing love. Abundant loving kindness. Abundant loving kindness. Great love would be another translation. Um, so in, in a number of the translations I was looking at of uh, English translations, a uh, number of different ways to translate one Hebrew word that this is, uh, the CSB translates it, uh, faithful love. So whenever you come across this word throughout the Psalms, uh, almost always it's this same Hebrew word. It's one word, uh, chesed. And you actually have to get it from underneath there, that little, uh, that chesed. Uh, and uh, it's uh, H-E-S-E-D. Uh, we would just say hesed, um, but a good Hebrew, a good Jew, would you have the, the hesed, uh, and uh, I know you want to do it. You're going to, you're, under your breath, you're like, uh, but you don't want to do that because you're fearful of somebody might think it's COVID, but um, it's, uh, it's hesed, and so, but it's this, this faithful love. There's, there's, you try to find a word to describe hesed and our, our our English language just falls short to try to describe it. We get it. There's times, there's experiences that go on in our, in our life that how do, you, how do you describe the feeling uh, of, uh, of this? Um, when I held my kids for the very first time, what word can I use to describe that? Um, when... When Angela and I, we were three months married to the day when we landed in this foreign country called Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, and we, we landed in Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, and uh, we, I started as a, uh, as, as a whole new role for me. I was a youth pastor uh, in Amen. And um, uh, I had no clue what I was doing. Uh, and... I'd been out of the Marine Corps for a year. We landed in, in, in Auckland, and th this feeling of overwhelmed. We, we virtually knew nobody when we landed there. Hadn't ever been there before. Whole new experience. We left family, friends, everything that we knew. We sold virtually everything. We got rid of it, and we land in this, uh, in this whole new world. Uh, and it was mostly good, but is, is overwhelming. What word do I use to des describe that feeling? I, I come up short. We, we get this uh, when, when it's hard to describe certain words. And, and I wanted to land here today because it's such an important word in describing the love of God for you. Uh, his love for all of us who have turned to him and walk in him, there is an abundance of faithful love, of chesed, of faithful love, this steadfast love that is poured out for you. How do we describe it? The translators use multiple words, right? Steadfast love, uh, abundant loving kindness, uh, 
the unfailing love, they're all words that try to describe this chesed love and it still falls short. It is when, uh, when the one that you expect the least from gives you the most. The very God who, who pours out upon you love when you, when you least deserve it. You get what you don't deserve. You, you, it's this mercy. It is a word that, that enraptures mercy, mercy that is poured out on you in spite of you. In spite of, in spite of the fact that you don't deserve mercy. And, and here's what this, this abundant faithful love is so great with is it's this ongoing, it's not just once, it's not twice, not three times, it's, it's this ongoing love, a constant love for you. It's abundant, faithful love, ongoing love for you. I will probably have to repeat this over and over again throughout the weeks because we hear it and we just don't believe it. But it is true. Our immediate response to God's chesed love for you is is probably something along the words that goes, nah. Not, not me. I love that about God. Oh, he loves, yes. Uh, but me. Uh. You wouldn't say that, Pastor John, if you knew what was going on in my world, in my mind, in my thoughts, and what I've been doing this past week. You wouldn't say that about me. It's not based off of what I say. It's off of what God has said. It is off of Him. Chesed. Abundant love for you. It's incredible. By the abundance of your faithful love, this is who He is. We will come across it more and more in our study through Psalms. But it's, it's, it's why the psalmist prays the way he does, why the psalmist invites the Lord into all of his life. It's, it's, it's why he runs to him and why my prayer is for you to run to him in all of life. He invites you to run to him in all of life. From just these short chapters, these psalms, we discover that he is our shield. He hears us and he answers. He is engaged. He doesn't ignore you. He he is holy. He is pure. He will bring about justice. He makes your way straight. He is trustworthy. Maybe another way to to say it is that he will hold you fast. He will hold you fast in spite of you. Um, This is the very character of God. He will hold you fast. Um, He holds on to you. He knows you. Every detail about you and he invites you to come. Uh, we, we see this in Matthew 11, right, where Jesus describes himself as gentle and lowly. He is gentle. We, we come to him. He will hold you fast. Let's, let's go to him. Let's, let's talk to him. Father, I no longer want to talk about you. I want to talk to you. Uh, and it's my prayer that, that we will be a people that talk to you. We will grow in that. 
that we'll do that in multiple ways. Lord, um, help us. We need you. Uh, the truths here are, are incredible. Um, they, they, just, they just don't seem real all the time for us, Lord. And yet your word is true. Your promises are true. You will accomplish your purposes no matter what. You will hold us fast. Even when we fail, you will hold us fast. So Lord, thank you. We, we are grateful and we, we turn to you. And, and Lord, I pray that this would be a, a, a room full of repenting uh, sinners, <laughs> people that turn to you, that turn from our ways and, and believe in you. Help us. It is in Jesus' powerful name that we pray. Amen.